if you're deciding to do a course through, let's say, um, e permit, that is not considered to be um, uh, that's not considered to be in 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 residence. In residence means here at Brooklyn. Um, along with that, thirty credits in residence, each major actually has um, a residency requirement for the major itself. It ranged between to 24 credits. And when we're going to take a look at Degree Works a little bit later on, and I'll be able to show you where on Degree Works you'll be able to see where your residency requirement is for your major. So when you're looking at it yourself, you will be aware of that. And then the last factor is that in order to be considered a good academic standing, you need to maintain a minimum of a 2.0 GPA or higher. Anything lower than a 2.0 is considered to be academic um, probation. Um, but you need to have at least a 2.0 or higher to be considered a good academic standing. That's a C average. So a C is a 2.0. Um, there are some majors on campus that do require a higher GPA requirement in order for a student to remain in that major and continue in that major. Um, one education, um, the education majors like early childhood education and childhood education require students to have at least a 2.75 GPA or higher to maintain their status in that major. So you want to make sure that you are well aware if your major requires a higher GPA, that you're well aware of that. But the 2.0 or higher is what's needed to be at good academic standing and also to maintain your financial aid if you receive financial aid, all right? Okay, so I wanted to kind of provide this sort of breakdown so you get an idea of what are the different ways to get you to 120 credits. So as I mentioned, the three parts that makes up the 120 are pathways, which is the gen ed, your major, um, which we have X there because every major is different and then elective. And that's the elective requirement is gonna be based on how many credits is left over to reach the 120 once you have fulfilled pathways and your major. So we give a first example of example A, which is a sociology major. The sociology major is roughly about 38 credits. So for a student who declares a major in that area, they have 42 credits that's needed for pathways, 38 credits for the major, and that leaves them with roughly 40 credits of electives to help them reach the 120. You can do a lot with 40 credits. You can take random courses as electives. Some students decide to do a minor. Some students might decide to do a second major. It's really up to you, but you have to get to 120. But then we have a major such as like early childhood education. And this is one of our majors on campus that does require a heavy amount of credits for the major. So that major requires 78 credits. So when you add that to what's needed for pathways, which is 42, that does not leave any room for electives. So a student who's in the early childhood education major, they'll find themselves taking just mainly pathways and major related courses. And all of that together will help them get to the 120 total. So you want to be very mindful of what your declared major is, understanding what you still need for pathways and, and what's needed for your major and what exactly will still need to be left over, if anything, in terms of electives to help you reach the 120 or higher. All right. So what I'm actually going to do right now um, is I'm going to log into DegreeWorks. Um, and I want to show you Degree Works because I feel like this is a very, very important tool that every student should be mindful of and know how to use properly. Um, this is what is utilized by the Office of Financial Aid to determine if you're taking the right classes. Um, this is what is utilized when you apply for graduation in your senior year and have determined that you are complete with everything that's needed for your degree. This is what's used by the degree audit staff in the Office of Registrar to determine if you are in fact done with your degree. So if you are not aware of what your degree works is showing you, or you're not aware of how to read it properly, um, I think it's very important for you to pay attention to this part. Um, if you're able to log in on your own, you can definitely do that. Um, but if not, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'll walk through as best as possible. Right. Okay, so um, what we have in front of us is a test sample of degree works. Um, this is a test student that we have in order to show students um, what exactly degree works is showing them. So I'm going to walk you through how to read um, degree works properly and how I actually share with students of how to read through degree works. So this example is of a student who transferred into Brooklyn College. Um, they came over with 30 credits. So if you're a student that transferred into the institution, the amount of transfer credits that you have will be posted at the top part of your degree works right next to where it says transfer credits. 
Um, your initial information will be at the top. So we'll show your name, your EMPL ID, um, your cumulative GPA. Um, it will also show like your class standing. Now, one thing I wanna point out is I've oftentimes seen where it says classification. Sometimes this can be a little off where uh, let's say a student is actually at junior class standing and it might say senior or it might say sophomore. So sometimes it can be a little bit off, um, but I do wanna share with you that class standing at Brooklyn College is based on how many credits you have earned. So if you have less than 30 credits earned, you're considered to be a first year student. If you have 30 to 59 credits earned, you're considered to be a sophomore. 60 to 89 credits earned is considered to be junior class standing and 90 or more credits earned is considered to be senior class standing. So class standing is based on how many credits you have earned. So the first part of degree works will show you sort of a basis synopsis of what you're gonna be reviewing um, in your degree work. So 120 credits is needed for your degree. The minimum credits of 30 credits in residence is needed. Your last 18 credits of residence is needed. Then it shows first off your general education requirements, which we refer to as pathways, your writing intensive requirement, your major requirement, and then the minimum GPA requirement. At the top here, where it shows 120 credits, once again, it's always constantly showing you the minimum amount of credits that's required to earn your degree. So it's 120 credits. And then it will also show credits applied. Now the credit applied number, just so you know, always um, includes completed and in progress credits. So for any of you that are enrolled in courses for the fall semester, this number here will reflect any classes that you've already completed, meaning that you earn a grade in those courses here at Brooklyn or you transferred into the institution and the courses that you currently are enrolled in for the fall semester, okay? So I just wanna point that out because we oftentimes have students um, misread this part of their degree works and don't actually understand this credit applied number, but it includes all completed and in progress courses, okay? So the first part of your degree works is always gonna show pathways. So the general education requirements. Um, this is the same for all students. Um, it does not change. If you decide to change your major, it will remain the same. There are three parts that make up pathways, the required common core, which consists of English composition one and two, a math and quantitative reasoning course, and a life and physical science course. We then have the flexible common core area, which consists of world cultures, US experience, two creative expression classes, individual and society, and a scientific world. And then we have the third part of the um, pathways, which is the college option area. Um, and the amount of credits that a student needs to take for the college option actually ranges between um, six to 12 credits. For any student who transfers into the institution with an associate's degree earned at a previous college, they will only be required to do six credits in college option. For any students who transfer in with more than 30 credits earned, they will only have to do nine credits. And any students who have 30 or less credits transferred in will have to do 12 credits. Um, the college option area consists of students having to fulfill an additional life of physical science, an additional world cultures or US experience. And for some students, they are required to do a language. And for some students, they are, um, have an option to do something else other than a language. So you want to pay very close attention to this part of your degree works to understand whether you need to take a language course or if you'll be able to take something else in lieu of a language. Um, but not every student is gonna be required to take a language course here at Brooklyn. Now, you have to take one course for each specific area here. You do not have to take the courses in the specific order. So you don't have to take life and physical before you can take world cultures. You can actually jump around in terms of how you're taking your classes for um, college option and for pathways. As well, you do not have to take all of your classes in order to then eventually move on to your major classes. Um, we recommend students doing about 15 credits a semester. I'm gonna um, touch base on that a little bit later on of why we recommend that. And so that's about like five classes a semester if possible. And I normally recommend students to do about, of their schedule, to do about two to three courses, be pathways courses, still in need of pathways courses. 
And then the remaining classes can be major specific classes. But this is a, a very important part of your degree requirements. You're responsible to fulfill all of the courses that's listed under Pathways. We then have the Writing Intensive course. And so as I shared in a previous presentation, um, either in your major will be a Writing Intensive course built in, or the major itself, once you declare it, will be considered a Writing Intensive major, and this box will be checked off. So for example, if you're declared as an English major, you will notice that this box will be checked off because the English major is considered to be Writing Intensive. For this example that we have in front of us, um, this student is a psychology major, specifically a BA, and the course that they will take that would fulfill their Writing Intensive course is Psych 3450W. So a writing intensive course will have a W letter at the end. So whenever a student signs up for that course, it will check off the writing intensive box for them. So the next part would be the major, whatever major you're declared in, it will specifically show you the classes in which you're responsible to take. Um, and then also, I, I didn't touch base on this. Anything that's a green checkbox is obviously a requirement that you've already fulfilled. It will show what class actually fulfills that requirement. You're done with it. You're all good. Anything that's a blue squiggly line are courses that you're currently having progress that are fulfilling a requirement that you need. So you'll see the blue squiggly line throughout in terms of pathways, as well as under the major. Anything that's a red box is what you need to focus on. So those are the courses in which in the future you will need to sign up for and that you're missing and that you need to fulfill, all right? Whenever you enroll in a class, and if it does not fulfill a part of your pathways or your major, it will fall to the bottom where it says elective classes allowed. So any course that is considered to be an elective, and courses that are elective are courses that don't go towards pathways and or the declared major, they will populate towards the bottom where it says elective classes allowed. Um, so these are the elective courses that this student in particular has so far. And all of these credits are counting towards the 120 the student needs to fulfill. And then at the bottom will be your in-progress courses. So the courses that you're currently enrolled in um, will always fall towards the bottom in alphabetical order. So you can see a snapshot of the classes that you're signed up for. And then you can always move your attention back up to see where those courses are fulfilling it in particular. Now, one last thing that I want to, um, two last things I actually want to point out um, is that I'm going to do what's called a what if degree works. Um, this is a really cool feature that we have in degree works for students who, let's say, if you're undeclared in a major and you're curious if you declared a certain major, what that would look like, if you've already done classes for that major, or if you're already declared in a major, but you're planning to change your major to something completely different. The what if feature is a great tool for you to see what that would look like if you change your major or declare a major. You're not officially declaring your major in this feature. It's just showing you um, a what if. So it's nothing permanent. So you can play around with this multiple times. So what will happen is you'll click on what if. So let's say the student is a psychology major and they decide that they actually want to major in biology. They're interested in taking science courses. They decide that they uh, want to fulfill prerequisites for med school. And so they want to look into doing um, biology as a major. So when you get to the what if page, um, the first thing you want to do is adjust the degree type. So the biology department offers both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science degree. So let's say the student decides they're just going to switch to, they're going to stick with the Bachelor of Arts. The catalog year um, for the degree is the year in which you started here at Brooklyn. So you want to be mindful to pay attention to what that catalog year is. And just so you know, if you're unsure what your catalog year is for your um, pathways, it will always show at the, the top portion here under above pathways. So this student is under 2020, 2021. And so you go down to where it says major and we wanna see what the biology major is. So you'll click down to biology and you'll highlight that. Now, any major that you select, the goal is to end, allow it to end up in this box here where it says chosen area study. And for that to happen, the student will also have to assign the catalog year to the major itself as well. Now, what ends up happening is the catalog year for the major will be based on when you actually declare the major or change the major. So for the fall semester, we are entering into the 2021 to 2022 undergraduate bulletin. 
So that is what you would highlight in order to get to that mark, all right? So the major ends up in that box there, and then you process what it, you can do different majors here. If you wanna see what a double major looks like, if you wanna see a minor, you can do all that. But what you do is you process what if, and what DegreeWorks will do is it will show you specifically um, what exactly you need to do if you change your major to biology. Pathways will remain the same. So that does not change. You're still responsible for those courses. But then you go under the major and you'll be able to see the specific courses in which you need to take if you declare a major in biology. If you've already fulfilled any courses that would go towards that major, they would populate in those respective areas. Um, but as you can see, the student hasn't done any science courses, so they would need to start from scratch if they decide to do um, biology as a major. All right, so that's a really cool tool to play around with if you're interested in changing your major, if you're interested in um, declaring a minor. Um, you can always schedule an appointment with a CAS advisor if you wanted to, to kind of talk about those different things you can do for changing your major because you have to keep into mind, you know, if there are certain like credit amounts, if you change your major, if you're going to keep you here much longer. So there's a bunch of different factors that have to be taken into account if that was the case. But really become, if you're not comfortable with using um, degree works, please become comfortable with using degree works. This is what is utilized to determine if you're completing your requirements, if you're gonna graduate from the institution, and this is what you really should be using to determine what classes you need to take. This is what we use in the CAS office. This is what your major advisor and your major department will be using. So you should be utilizing it too, and you have access to it. All right. Presentation. Okay. So hopefully that was helpful for you all to understand. Um, okay. So the next thing that I want to actually touch base on is degree maps. So what degree maps are? So it's a breakdown of the courses that students are required to take each term in order to graduate in a four-year time span without having to take summer and winter courses. Um, degree maps allow students to understand the sequencing of courses, especially within their major, and it also provides them with a clear map of their academic tenure here at Brooklyn College and allows them to see and understand the big picture, which is degree completion. Um, so our office worked hand in hand with multiple major departments on campus to establish degree maps um, for each major. I believe we have every single major that's offered at Brooklyn um, that has done a degree map. And it pretty much gives students a very clear idea of what they should be taking each semester. Um, I think it's a great tool for students, especially upper class students to utilize, especially for your major. Um, it doesn't replace you meeting with a major advisor and really understanding what classes you need to take in your major, but it does give you a clear idea of what the major department wishes for students to actually um, take their classes and what order they need to take those courses. Um, I'm actually gonna show you how to get to um the the page that is specifically for degree maps so each of you are aware of that okay so when you go to the brooklyn college website degree maps are actually housed on our the um, cas office web page you'd go to offices and services and we are at the top academic advisement and student success you'll go to our website and on the right-hand side, you will see where it says degree maps. You can do it by your school. If you're unsure what school your major is under, you can go to all maps and just search for your major. Um, but let's say if you are a BS in, in accounting, it specifically has what the accounting department recommends students taking every single semester. Um, so in the first semester, accounting, introductory accounting, elementary uh, microeconomics, they then want students to move on to macroeconomics, a general elective, and it gives you a semester by semester outline of how you should be taking your courses and especially your major specific classes within your major. At the bottom of the de degree map, we'll also have the contact information for the department. So who the advisor for the department is that you should be reaching out to. So in this case, the chairperson of the department is Daniel Tickleman, and then the, the accounting department actually has a professional advisor within that department. And so that person's contact information is here. 
So this is also the second tool that I think is really great for students to actually utilize are the degree maps, um, because it really gives you sort of a clear picture of what you should be taking each semester. And you can look it up for any major on here, and it shows you specifically what you should be taking. So definitely utilize this. And if you're unsure of who the point person is in your major department, you would be able to find that contact information for that person at the bottom of the respective degree map for your major, all right? Okay, now credit counts. Now, earlier on, I had mentioned that we recommend in our office for students to take roughly 15 credits a semester. Um, and the reason why we recommend this is because when you do the math, if you're a student that starts here as a first year student, and if you take at least 15 credits a semester and successfully pass your courses each semester, you will complete your degree in four years time. So 15 credits each semester, there's two semesters in the year, fall and spring that equals to 30 credits um, at the end of the school year. 30 times four gives you 120 credits. That's the easy math. Um, now, if you're a student that is an Excelsior scholarship recipient, do understand that in order to maintain your Excelsior scholarship, you need to earn 30 credits at the end of your school year. If you earn anything less than that, you will be in jeopardy of losing your Excelsior scholarship. So this is another reason why we recommend students doing 15 credits a semester. Another reason is that understand that full-time standing at Brooklyn College is 12 to 18 credits. So if you're enrolled in 12 credits, 15, 16, 18 credits, you're charged the same amount in terms of the full-time tuition costs. So it just makes sense to be in 15 credits if you can or more, if you feel that you can handle more of um, than 15 credits, because you'd be saying, paying the same amount if you were in 12 credits. So it just makes sense to, take 15 and kind of remain on track. Um, you are allowed to take classes during the summer and winter sessions. I oftentimes tell students though that normally during the summer and winter sessions, if you're taking courses, normally if you receive financial aid, financial aid do not, does not cover those courses um, during the summer and the winter terms. I do tell every student that every student is different. So to always follow up with financial aid, just to be um, clear on that but I always tell students to prepare themselves that if they're gonna take summer and winter courses, then more than likely they would have to pay out of pocket. Um, so being able to take 15 credits a semester and passing your courses will ensure that you don't have to take courses during the summer and winter session if you don't need to, okay? All right, now the advisement structure here at Brooklyn College, just so you know, is a sort of two prong system. So we have the CAS office, which is the office that I am a part of, and what we focus on primarily are gen ed requirements, academic policies and procedures, academic planning. We advocate for the students in different circumstances. And we also help in problem solving and troubleshooting students um, if they have any issues or concerns. And we also assist with guiding students if they are planning to do any sort of petition um, to the bulletin. So if they're petitioning to take more than the allowable um, limit for a semester or their petition and anything else to the bulletin. That's what we focus on in the CAS office. In the academic department, so specifically when you declare your major, that is gonna be your academic department. They focus on major requirements, so advising on the major, your field of study, any idea or questions you have in regards to career outlook, mentorship opportunities and research opportunities. So you are required um, to officially be declared in a major once you have um, 60 or more credits earned. Um, that is to ensure that you're continuing to progress towards completing your degree, as well as it's needed to continue to maintain your financial aid. For students who are not declared in a major by the time they have 60 credits, and that's when you're officially considered to be a junior, um, they will lose their financial aid. So once you have 60 or more credits, you are required to declare your major. You can declare your major before that point in time, but you're gonna be mandated to be declared by the time you have 60. And so once you have 60 credits, that's when you wanna really start meeting with your major department consistently each semester to make sure that you're taking your classes in the correct format 
Um, you yes can utilize degree maps, but it doesn't beat you actually establishing a connection with your major department um, and not only discussing course options and course um, progression in your major, but also talking about what can you do with the, the degree once you graduate, career outlook and mentorship opportunities and so on. Um, so if you are declared in a major and you have not sort of connected with your major department, you want to really get into the habit of starting to do that. And you should really be meeting with your major department at least once a semester, if not more. But this is sort of the academic structure we have here at Brooklyn College and that we desire for students to follow as they're progressing towards completing their degree. Now, if you wish to actually schedule an appointment with our office, like if you do have any questions in regards to pathways or your gen ed or petition or anything else in terms of academic planning, um, we do offer um, advisement through our CAT system um, and students can schedule an appointment with us um, in our CAT system and BC Web Central. Our appointments right now are, are through um, phone appointments. Um, in the fall, we will have advisors on campus, I believe every single day. Um, and those appointments will have to be scheduled online. Um, so we will have in-person as well as um, phone appointments. But for the duration of the summer, our appointments are through um, phone. And so this is the way that you can actually schedule an appointment. We do fill up pretty quickly. We've been um, very busy. Our office is responsible, not just with meeting with um, continuing students, but we're also meeting with all first year students that are starting in the fall semester and new transfer students. Um, so we do fill up pretty quickly. Um, so if you ever have like any questions or concerns, or if let's say you tried to schedule an appointment and we're completely booked, we do um, recommend students to send an email to our office, um, to our general office inbox, and we are able to address um, questions over email as well. But this is the way that if you do want to meet with a CAS advisor, this is the steps that you would follow to actually schedule such appointment. Um, and this is um, our contact information. This is where we're located when we're back on campus. So we're in Boylan Hall on the third floor in the back. Um, and our email is caass at brooklynvacuni.edu. Um, so this is where we are. And that is the end of my presentation. And I will open it up for questions. Um, I have a question. Okay. So say a student is like getting ready to graduate. They have 119 credits, but mm -hmm. they need one more credit. Um, what would you recommend them doing? Um, is, is there a way that they can like get an internship and earn their credits like that? Or do you just recommend them taking like a course? Yeah, I would say start with, I would recommend with them taking a course. Um, you can do a two credit class because the school does not offer a lot of one credit courses, to be quite honest. Um, so I would recommend students doing like a two credit class. Most of our two credit courses are kinesiology based classes, like physical education courses, like yoga and Pilates, or you would do like a three credit course. So you can graduate with more than 120. You just can't graduate with anything less. Now, if you want to speak to your major department, I don't know what your major is. Um, to, to find out if there is an internship opportunity that you can maybe uh, partake in and receive credit for. That is another way you can also make up those credits, um, but you would have to be enrolled in something. So most departments, there's only one major on campus that actually requires an internship as part of their major requirement. Um, that's the communication major, um, but no other major on campus actually requires an internship. So if you wanted to do something like that, um, it would be a conversation with your major department um, and they would more than likely, if that is something you would do, they would do a, um, they would do like a, it would probably be like a course number or something that they would like recommend you doing. But I normally tell students to look into like just adding a course. And for that one, that one, like two credit course, like you could take, you, can you get financial aid for that or would you have to pay that like completely out of pocket? I mean, if you if you're um, just in that one class, you can speak to financial aid to find out because um, every student's financial aid situation is very different. Um, so I just always and, and I'm not a financial aid advisor, so I always tell students to speak to financial aid. Now, if you're in if you're enrolled in like 12 credits already, um, but you still need to add more credits to reach the 120. Remember, 12 to 18 credits is full time standing, so it will be covered within that bucket. Um, but if it's just the one class that you're taking, you definitely would want to speak to financial aid to find out if 
if it is possible that you could be covered. Okay, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Great question. If you have questions, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hands and um, Claudine will see you. Um, David has a question or he has a comment. You can, David. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't type it well. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that you can, you can go above um, 15 credits because that's one of the worries I had when I was a student in college was I had close to, I was close to being 119, one credit away from graduating. But then after going to Benito, um CAS, I don't know, <laughs> say, well, they told me, yes, you can go above 120 credits and above the 15 credit limit per semester. There is a limit though, there's 18 credits. That's an absolute mm -hmm. limit you can take, but you can take a three credit course above the five classes you're already taking. So that's good. Yeah. And it will cover it, it'll be, it'll be covered by financial aid. So you're okay with that. It has to be at least 12 credits per semester. That's the only limitation that will be coming. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have some questions? Um, Christy, do you want to um, unmute yourself? Hello? Can you hear hi. me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. OK, good. Um, hi. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so I followed along doing degree works and everything. I'm planning on being business administration. My concentration would be marketing. Mm -hmm. So when I go on to do degree works and I look at the little major section, the, the only requirement I see basically is that I must pick a concentration for this major is when I pick the concentration, will more requirements pop up or am I just doing something wrong? <laughs> are you, are you referring to your, you did a what if feature or? Yes. Yes. So, okay, so when you do the what if for business, what you're gonna have to do is you'll select the major as business administration and then you'll select the concentration and you have to assign yes. a catalog year to both. Okay, I only yeah. did that. Okay, <laughs> that um, makes a lot of sense, thank you. Yeah, if you, if I can um, try to show you real quick, if you don't mind, um, let's see. Um, and most of the degrees under Macaulay, I don't know if that changes anything too. Oh, that does get a little different. I mean, I, the classes <laughs> still remain the same. It's just that obviously Macaulay has like all these other requirements that you have. Yeah. To um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but the, the the courses for the major itself should be the same. But what you have to do to see the what if, you have to select um, for the major business administration, you got to assign that a catalog year. And then under concentration, you, you said it was marketing you're interested in? Yes. Okay, and you will select marketing and you will do cons um, a catalog year for that. And both of those should end up in the box. And when you process what if, you'll see everything. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Mari, did you have a question? Yeah, hi. So hi. Um, I, I want to complete the uh, e-permit. So I was thinking for the advice, should I contact my um, major department or the class department? So I'm majoring in uh, exercise science, but the class I want to make uh, a permit is Spanish. So whom should I contact about it? So you can speak to, so Spanish, you're taking that for pathways. Um, yeah. So you can speak to the, a CAS advisor in regards to that. Um, but do you know how to do an e-permit? Like, do you know how to apply no. for it? No. Okay. Um, so if you go to the school's website, and go to our search box on the school's website and just type in e-permit. The e-permit office actually has a really extensive like page that goes over everything that, um, like all the guidelines for e-permit as well as like how to actually apply for an e-permit. Um, it's pretty straightforward and thorough. And then in the e-permit system, in, it is in CUNY first, it will show you like if you um, have, are taking, plan to take like a class at Medgar. Or some, I'm just throwing out mega efforts. Um, it will show you the equivalency. So like if you wanted to come back over as like Spanish 1010 here, it will show you what the equivalency is there. Um, so really you can, you, if you just go to the school's website and type in e-permit, it will actually show you like all the guidelines, all the steps. It's a pretty simple, straightforward process. Um, if you're planning to do it for the fall, you do want to be mindful of what the deadline is. Um, I believe there's a certain deadline you, if you're applying for e-permit that you have to do it by um let me look at the academic calendar real quick 
and everyone always look at the academic calendar for each um, semester. It has all the deadlines, like when classes start, the last day to add, last day to drop, um, when withdrawal period begin, if you have an incomplete from the spring or summer, when to um, rectify that, all that's gonna be on the academic calendar. Um, let's see. So the last day to file an um, e-permit request for the fall is August 24th. And on that subject, I have a question from Andrea. Is there an extra fee for an e-permit? No, I think your charge is the same. It's, it's still considered to be, because it's within CUNY, it's still considered to be like within like your total credit amount, if that makes sense. <laughs> but I don't think there's an extra fee. Karina has a question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was looking at my transcript and I noticed there was an area where it says earned credits and then attempted credits. I was wondering if you could explain like the difference between the two. Okay, so earned credits will include like if you transferred into the institution, any transfer credits you have and any credits that you actually passed and have like a passing grading. Um, attempted means like any class that you're probably having progress or attempted, maybe like you withdrew from it or failed the course, that's considered to be a course that you actually attempted. Um, any course that you dropped, so like understand that like each semester there's like a drop period. So that's like if you're enrolled in let's say bio 1010 and you decide that you're not gonna take it, like you're in 15 credits and one of the classes is bio 1010 and you decide you, you just wanna be in 12 credits and you drop that class, that's not gonna be a part of your attempted credits because you weren't enrolled in the class, you dropped it before the withdrawal period. So attempted is like that period where like you attempted to take the course and for whatever reason, maybe you didn't pass it or you withdrew from it. Um, that's what that um, number is. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. I've never had a student really ask that question before. <laughs> I love that. Do we have any more questions? From These are great questions, by the way. Really awesome questions. Um, I have a question. Um, the minor, can you explain what is definition of a minor and should students um, have a minor or do, do you, what do you advise? Okay, so great question. So the first thing I would let everyone know is that you are all required to declare one major and one major alone. That's it. You're not required to declare a second major. You're not required to declare a minor. All right, that's up to you if you decide that you wanna do that. A minor allows students to be able to take classes in a certain area of study without sort of devoting the whole time that it would take to do it in a major. So for example, a psychology major is about 32.5 credits, but a minor in psychology is only 12 credits, so just four classes. So I tend to recommend students, especially let's say if they're in, if they have a lot of electives left over, um, it, you know, it's different for every student, but let's say if I'm meeting with a student and when they're done with their pathways and um, their major, they will still have 30 credits of electives left over. I will ask the student, what, what do you feel comfortable? Do you feel comfortable just taking 30 random credits? If you're comfortable with that, that's cool. If you wanna do a minor, you have room to do a minor. Some students might decide to do a second minor. Um, some students might decide to do a second major if that's even possible. And in some situations that is possible. So a minor is just allowing you to be able to take classes in an area that interests you, um, but not to be able to devote like the amount of credits that would be needed to major in that area. Um, most minors are about, they range between 12 to about like 21 to 24 credits. Most, most minors are about 12, 15 credits. There are some that are like 21 credits. Um, 24, I think is the highest number I've seen, which is kind of like almost like a second major. Um, and some minors are very flexible, meaning that I'll use psychology again. The psych minor is 12 credits and it just says any 12 credits of advanced psych courses. So you can do any four psych courses that are 3000 level or higher, where there are some minors, let's say like the marketing minor that are very specific. You have to take 18 credits. These are the six courses you have to take, all right? So 
Um, the school website actually has a very extensive list of all the minors that we offer here at Brooklyn, as well as all the majors. So you can definitely take a look at that, but understand you're only required to declare one major. If you decide to do a second major or a minor, that's up to you. It's good to speak to someone in CAS first before you do that. So we can do the um, numbers calculation and determine if you do have room for that. Very interesting. Um, so we have another question from Victoria. Victoria, yeah. do you want to unmute yourself and um, ask your question? Yeah, hi. I was just asking if the only way to remove an F from your transcript is by retaking the course. Okay, let's- Or is let's, there like a different way? Let's, let's discuss that removal, that word remove. <laughs> so, um, all right, so every student has, um, within their CUNY career, has 16 credits of what we refer to as F replacement. So if you are a student and you failed a course, a failing grade is a grade that's an F, an F-I-N, which I'll explain what that is, or a W-U, which is a university withdrawal. Um, those three grades are considered to be failing grades. So let's say you were enrolled in Bio 1010 and you failed Bio 1010. Um, in order to utilize your F replacement, you would have to retake the course over at the institution that you failed it, which is Brooklyn, and receive a grade of a C minus or better for the failing grade to be forgiven from your GPA calculation. It is not removed from your transcript though. So what ends up happening is that when you retake the course over and you get the better grade, um, the registrar's office will put a notation under the failing grade that explains that it is forgiven and excluded from your GPA calculation as well as your credit total. Um, so that's the way to have it um, averaged out of your GPA calculation is that you would have to retake the class over, but it's not removed from your transcript. And you're only allowed 16 credits during your whole CUNY career. Now, what do I mean by that? So we have students who transfer into Brooklyn. Let's say you attended Kingsborough for two years and you failed two classes at Kingsborough and actually retook those courses and earned the grade that's needed for it to be forgiven then you use six credits at, six, at Kingsborough and you only have 10 credits of effort placement remaining remain here. So that's, that's the circumstance. But in terms of it getting removed from your transcript, like completely wiped out, you were never in the course, that, that doesn't happen because you were in the class and you attempted it and unfortunately you failed it. But if you want it to be factored out of your GPA average, you would need to retake the course over. If you have credits and effort placement remaining. And if you don't, you can always check in with someone in CAS and we can check for you. Um, and you would have to take it over and receive a C minus or better. And you can take it over at any point in time. Um, someone, I saw someone post, what is FIN? Um, so what an FIN is, is an incomplete grade that has changed over to a failing grade. So each semester, um, if you are in a course and for some reason, let's say you've missed assignments in the class, or maybe you've missed an exam, um, the professor can make a decision that instead of giving you a final grade, they can give you what's called an incomplete grade. In essence, the professor is giving you additional time beyond the end of that semester to make up whatever work you're missing for that class. So let's say you were in a course for the spring semester and a professor decides to give you an incomplete for that class, you will have until a certain time frame in the fall semester to make to work with that professor and make up the missing work for that course. What that deadline is, it's going to be on. It's always on the academic calendar. There's always a date on the academic calendar that specifies any incomplete grade from the spring slash summer will need to be resolved by this date in the fall. If it's not resolved by then, then the INC changes to a FIN, which is a, in essence a failing grade. So it changes to an F. So that's what, what an FIN is. I hope I addressed that. Um, Mary, did you, your hand is up. Is that um, from before or did you have another question? Oh, that was from before, sorry. Okay. Um, anyone else with some questions? These are very good ones, very complicated. <laughs> The WU, mm -hmm. you're saying that is a university, that's when yeah. you 
So tell that me. one, so let me explain how, when that one pops up. So if a student, um, so there's like two very, or three very weird sort of grades a student might see on their record. There's WU, WN, and WD. Um, so a W, I'll explain the WN and the WD first. So a WD is if you, when we enter into the drop period um, of the semester, so there's a period when classes start, if you decide that you're gonna drop a class from your record um, and you're in that drop period. So this is before the withdrawal period begins. And the withdrawal period is when you're enrolled in the class, you decide you're not gonna take it anymore, you withdraw from the class and so you get a W grade. Um, the WD period is within the drop period. And this, this letter grade is more for financial aid purposes. It shows up on your degree works, but it does not show up on your transcript. WN is if you enroll in a class and you do not attend the class, like at the beginning of the semester, because at the beginning of the semester, professors have to submit their roster. So you show up to the first day of cl your classes and the second day and so on. And the professor has to submit their roster for that semester. Um, towards the beginning. If you have not reported to your class, then normally you get what's called a WN grade. So it's like you're in essence sort of dropped from the course um, because you did not attend at all. A WU is a student actually attends class at the beginning of the semester, but for some weird reason, just drop off the map. Like they just stop attending. They're not turning in assignments. They just completely disappear then a professor can give a student what's called a WU. So you were in the class for some time. You didn't withdraw yourself from the course. You didn't drop yourself from the course, but you completely stop attending. So that's normally when we see a WU grade. And that is, it's the same as an F. It's exactly calculated the same as an F. So that's very important because that will affect your GPA. You can't yes, just very much. It does affect your GPA, yes. It brings it down. <laughs> well, we should have another workshop on about how to bring up your GPA because it's so difficult once your GPA dips to um, boost it up. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone, before we close out, um, Alicia, uh, do you have a question? You want to unmute yourself? Me? <laughs> I saw your hand. Did you have a hand up? I think oh, I see her. No, I didn't have a hand okay. up. Okay. Amber, right. Amber, hand up. Okay, Amber. Um, I just don't. Uh oh. <laughs> Only question I had was kind of like, I'm not sure if like you can answer this, but it's like for online classes, do you know how long that's actually going to be like a thing? Because like, I know there's some people who are like trying to get into working but while doing this. So I want to know like, is long, is like online classes going to be a long-term thing for Brooklyn College? I, um, I wish I could answer that, Amber, but I, I, I'm just as much in the same ballpark as you are as well. Um, I, I would imagine that, you know, it's, what's going to be a big factor is really what's going on public health wise in the city and in the state. Um, I mean, that does play a big factor in like, you know, this, the institution is trying to do what's like safe for students, faculty and staff. Um, and so I think, you know, offering online versus in person hybrid is based on whatever classes is on in person, how can it be done in a safe manner, by the way. Um, so I think, you know, what's going on public health wise is, is playing a big factor, but, you know, we don't know if this is going to be a long term thing or whatnot. I, I, I just know for the fall semester, there's a certain percentage that is going to be online and a certain percentage that will be in person slash hybrid. Hopefully things are better. Fingers crossed by spring 2022 that we're much better as a city and state and country and world. Um, that, you know, we can get back to some sort of like, you know, being more in person, um, but nothing definitively has been decided. So um, I'm going to ask one more question by Andrea, and then we're going to close out. Um, she asks, if I drop a course, will it affect my GPA like an F? So if you drop, remember, if you drop a course within the drop period, it's as if you were never enrolled in the class. Um, so it wouldn't affect your GPA because you beat the course because you dropped it. If you withdraw from a course, so let's say if you're, we're now in the withdrawal period, 
um, and you withdraw from a course, you're going to get a W grade. That also does not affect your GPA because a W grade, just a single W, this is different from a WU or WN or WD. Um, a W grade does not affect your GPA either um, because you made the decision for whatever reason to withdraw from a course. Um, and so a W is zero, but it's a neutral zero, as I like to call it. Um, but I would say before you like drop a class, you know, keep in mind your credit total, because obviously, let's say if you're only enrolled in 12 credits and you're dropping a class or withdrawing from a class, you're going down to less than 12, which is not full time anymore, it's part time. So that could affect your financial aid, like if you receive TAP or, or Pell. So that's a factor to keep in mind. Um, another reason, just to plug why we, you know, stress students to actually take 15 credits or more a semester is that let's say if you're enrolled in 15 credits and you have to withdraw or drop a class and you go down to 12 credits, you're still full time. Um, so that's another reason why we recommend students doing 15 credits or more, um, just to, so they have that buffer just in case. Um, but if you drop a class, no, it does not affect your GPA. If you withdraw from a class, it does not affect your GPA negatively, but you would have to be mindful of your credit totals and where you will stand if you, know, you drop or withdraw from a course. Well, Claudine, thank you so much. Awesome. Um, what, a, what an hour of information. I hope everyone was able to ask their questions. If not, um, I'm sure you can uh, email Cass. And mm -hmm. if anybody wants to um, talk about some whatever their degree progress is or talk about changing majors, um, they can also speak to me. You can um, uh, contact me through email. And um, for our squad members, I have an exercise for our chat and chill on Thursday. I'd like everyone to try the what if feature on degree works and come up with some hypothetical if they change, if you change your major. And we'll talk about that on Thursday. Tomorrow, we're going to have a representative from the Office of Financial Aid. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions there. I didn't even want to go there with you, Claudine, because I know it's so complicated. But I want to thank you and thank everybody who came. I hope to see everyone tomorrow and um, we will see you, I hope, Claudine, back on campus um, someday. <laughs> thank you. Take care, everyone.